Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Backstage Pass. My name is Dean Butch, I'm your host of the show, and in today's episode, I'm super lucky I get to sit down with a friend of mine that I've known for years. He's got a great new album out with the number one smooth jazz song at the moment. Please put your hands together and welcome Rick Braun. <laughs> Dude, 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 dude. I mean that in the most loving way. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. What is new? Yeah. Apart from well, your new album, your number one hit. Yeah, yeah. Back to back with Brian Culbertson. Yes, you have an amazing memory, Dane. You just told me. I know. <laughs> but the album, can you feel it? Tell me about it. Well, you know, this is, um, um, the record before this, I did a vocal record, and I wanted to explore that whole standards and singing and playing in the style of Chet Baker and kind of going, going back to some of the songs that I was listening to as a kid. But for this CD, I kind of went back to the spirit of uh, Beat Street, which was a, a CD I did early in my career, and it really just put me on the map. And that CD was a, pretty much a garage band approach. I brought David Palmer and who was the drummer with Rod Stewart into my house, and uh, Cliff, Cliff Hugo, who was a uh, bass player with Ray Charles. And we did Beat Street in my house, and the house was an old, it was built in 1925, and we recorded in the rooms, and the sound of the house actually was incorporated into the recording. Where you live, in Calabasas? I, in Woodland Hills, yeah, well, which is right around the corner. Is that where I went when we had uh, around Thanksgiving. No, you went to my new house. That this new house was because when you said it was built in '52. It, yeah, no, right. it was 1925. That house was like, like a, Sorry. Old, a French artist lived in. It was a very beautiful house. So the acoustics small. are good then, right? That was a big part of that record. But the whole concept of it being like a garage band, and we just I went in with half baked ideas and and just let everybody kind of throw their input into it, right. and it, and, it, and it organically grew into something. And that's the energy that I wanted to bring to Can You Feel It? And from the response that it has gotten, I, I think I, think I kind of got, got that down a little bit. So when you've gone from that, how do you capture that acoustic sound then with this new album and, but still getting the same feel? Well, this is, this is a different thing. I mean, my house now, it's, this, the studio is very uh, soundproof and very, very, you know, um, uh, it's it's very soundproof. So that actual that actual sound of the house isn't in this record. Right. But the spirit of the players, and what I what I would do is everybody comes in to make a record, and the first thing everybody does is they they play minimally. It's like they don't want to. Players when when I when I produce a record, you know, players tend to want to dial back what they normally would do. Like they wouldn't play like they're playing on the show because it's a record. Right. So you want to like pull it all back. So what I did on this record, I said, no, I want you to play this like it's your record. I want you to play your part, the drums, the bass, right, right, right. The, the rhythm guitar, everything, the keyboards, everything. I, uh, when I invited people in, I encouraged them to push their limits and to put as much of their own personality into the record as they possibly could. And do they? They absolutely do. do it takes a minute because it's a little bit of a surprise. Right, that's what I was going to ask. Do you really have to push them and encourage them? And yeah, yeah, but but you know it. I mean, when when it when it happens, when the magic happens, and sometimes sometimes somebody comes in and it's the first. I always have the record button on. For instance, I, when I recorded the Peter White Christmas record, uh -huh. which featured Jeffrey Osborne, um, he came over to my house, and uh, we spent Christmas Eve together again this time. So it was fun. But uh, he came over to my house years back, and I had tested all the microphones because you know I've produced a lot of records, I've right. recorded, I engineer a lot of records and mix them. So I checked the microphone level out by singing into the vocal, and I sing in the microphone, and I checked the level. I always have it in record the first time. So Jeffrey came over and he sang Silent Night. Wow. And he stepped up to the mic, you know, the track came on, and the very first thing he sang was absolutely gorgeous. Now, the difference in level between Jeffrey Osborne's voice and my voice, <laughs> I'm watching the needles pinning, and I'm going, oh, dear Lord, please don't distort. And it didn't, thankfully, because, actually, because that particular track was about two steps too high for him. Okay. But he didn't realize it until he had actually sang the perfect take. His voice is phenomenal. It's amazing. And then he, and then he beat me in a horse on my basketball court. He beat you on a horse? No, in, in a game of horse. Uh -oh. It's a basketball game. Got it. I thought you might have. Do you want me to explain it? Yeah, I know George, you're Australian. It's like you 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 make a shot, 
Right. And then the other person has to make the same shot. Are you good at basketball? He killed me. Are I, you good? I, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, my game is diminishing rapidly as my golden years approach. You might want to sit on a horse and it might be easy to get the hoop in. I <laughs> really don't think so. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> getting back to that, to the record though. So you say that, that you had to really encourage uh, some artists to really like push and, and go to the next level. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, have you had to tell an artist to pull back a bit? Absolutely, absolutely. Who? Mm. I want to get the I want to get the I'll give, you get an the I'll give you an example, and it's a good friend of mine. He's a great player, great player. I was producing Mark Antoine's record, um, okay. Madrid, and I invited Bob Shepard to come in and play. Now, Bob Shepard has played with her with with Freddie Hubbard. Mm -hmm. He's played with so many great straight ahead artists. But Bob didn't get the concept of lead instrument, then Bob. Right. He didn't get the idea. So he would play all this brilliant stuff, but he'd play it over top of what right. Mark was playing. So I had to really coach him to, okay, <clears throat> I'm kind of conducting him. Okay, play now. Don't play. Don't play. Don't play. And once he got that, it was amazing. It's interesting. You often find with singers uh, that they often over-sing each other, not really listen to each other. Right. And do you find that with musicians? Do they try to outplay each other? Um, I haven't really... Because, like, when you're doing BWB, for example, yeah, you, get, you guys just have this chemistry that just sort of harmonizes and just, it's like a jigsaw. You, it fits and it just works. Was that off the bat? Did you have to get to that? Did you guys have to talk about it and be like, you know, chill out on this song, I'm, I'm doing this? No, I mean, we, we, we have... Uh, I mean, Kirk Whalem and I, we finish each other's phrases. We're both left-handed. We're both, we both, uh, he'll start something. For instance, we started a horn part the other day. He got up and played something, and halfway through it, I was in it playing the harmony. And I knew how he was going to finish it before he even finished it. Right. And he does the same thing with me. And, and it, it's, there's a chemistry that happens, and I don't think there's a lot of, uh, there's not a lot of one-upsmanship in, in it, but what there is is the healthy respect and, and the inspiration of having all of those great, you know, like having Norman and Kirk on stage, it's, I'm in heaven. Right, right. I'm in heaven, man. It's like, Who does the arrangements? Um, when we did, um, when we did Human Nature, mm -hmm. we all kind of took, you know, we, we, first of all, we, we, we took the songs that we loved, all the Michael Jackson songs, and we, we had about 40 of them. Right. So we had to, we decided to turn it over to the engineer rather than us deciding which ones would make the final cut. Were there certain, do you interrupt real quick, were there certain songs that you were like, I have to have that on there? Well, yeah, because my wife wanted to have Billie Jean on the record, and so we had to make sure, you know, happy wife, happy life, for sure. <laughs> so, you know, she, she was actually the, the, the person who, who figured out what the first song was going right. to be, and that was Billie Jean. So okay. we got that on. I want to come back to the question about the engineer and, and how you chose the songs. We'll be right back after this break. You're watching Backstage Pass with Rick Braun. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Backstage Pass. We're here with Rick Braun. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> so before we went to commercial, we were talking about how the engineer, you had 40 songs, and, and he then gets to choose. Uh, we, we all picked uh, a couple of songs, uh -huh. we all picked it, and then we delegated out certain songs were were just uh, you know inspired different people. Like Kirk uh, wanted to do uh, "Man in the Mirror," my favorite song. He did "Man in the Mirror," and and that sounds amazing. He, um, he and he and John Stoddard did that, and John Stoddard had a, a big hand in, in the record. Uh, who was a wonderful keyboard yeah, yeah. player and arranger. Um, and then I I felt strongly about, of course, Billie Jean, yeah. and I, I also did an arrangement of "Beat It," which is kind of a ska reggae. Thing, and then I did an arrangement of uh, Shake Your Body Down to the Ground. Mm -hmm. So I did those three, and then uh, and, and Kirk and, and John kind of kind of did uh, did the others. Okay, what is your favorite Michael Jackson song? Wow! Is it beat it! Yeah, oh my God! I I think uh, you know there's so many. I mean, I love Shake Your Body Down to the Ground. That's like old school Michael Michael Jackson. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jackson Five. I like the old Jackson Five. You know. So when you come back in March, maybe you'll uh, dance that in Dancing with the Stars to that song. We, no. Wouldn't you like that? <laughs> See, you almost got me there. You almost got me there. <laughs> I had sheer terror in my heart. I was sitting there. I was like, you got to do Dancing with the Stars. You know, I'm sitting there. I'm like watching these and I'm watching Mark Antoine kind of like trying to remember. Did that. you see the show? I did not see the show. I think I was playing with somebody at that moment. But, you know, I was sitting, I was, I, my, my, I was willing but, but I was like just absolutely 
terrified at the thought of trying to dance and do that stuff. Because I can't remember anything. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, I can't remember what steps to do or anything like that. But speaking artistically, you know, you play the trumpet, you sing, you're doing the trombone. What, what other artistic uh, skills and, and, and things do, are you interested in? Well, I, you know, I, when I was, of course, I was, you know, singing. I've been singing uh, a lot, and, and I play some guitar. I played a couple of chords on guitar. Um, you know, the trombone's a recent development. I just started to learn how to play that. But what about... I thank all of you for tolerating my, my amateur trombone playing on the boat. I've been having a ball with it, so, you know. But outside of, outside of music, do you, I mean, do you paint? Do you draw? I, do I, you... I do. I have power tools. I have a whole bunch of power tools. <laughs> really? I do. I have routers. I have uh, a table You're saw. A I have all of that stuff, yeah. I've built a lot of stuff around the house. I've built cabinets. I built a tool shed. I built a pergola at the bottom of our hill. I built... Uh... From scratch or like Ikea, just putting it together? No, no, from scratch, from scratch. All right. You know, uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. I, you tell me, I believe you. Yeah, I've done it, yeah. A couple things. Two, three things, <laughs> some fences, all that stuff. Now, um, your son is very good at basketball. He's a very good basketball player. We're really, really, he's having a good How time. old's Kyle now? He's 13. He's 13. And uh, it's interesting because, uh, you know, you, you, as a dad, like dads have never, it's like dads, you, you, it's like a real passing of the torch. That's right. what, I'm, what I'm feeling with him and what I'm observing. And it's a, such a learning experience for me because, you know, a, a coach has never given a player more playing time because the dad asked for it. Right. It's like try, a player trying to reverse a call with a referee. It's just, so I have to sit there and just go like this. And uh, he's a really good player. I mean, he scores half the team's points on occasion. And he's shot like five out of six three-pointers against Van Nuys, you know, and, uh, you know high school. Because he's not terribly tall for his age. He's, he's kind of medium tall, but what he is is a great ball handler, and he has great court vision, and he sees passes that are really tight. And he gets, he's hit guys on the head that weren't looking for the ball. And that's the sign of a good point guard. You, wanna, you get the ball inside, and if somebody's not looking for it, they're going to look for it the second time, you know. Do they, do your kids, your son and your daughter, do they look at you, they obviously don't look at you as Rick Braun, right? And oh, hey. So do they, not that, not that you are any sort of diva or anything, but do they, do they ground you in that sense? You know, I can come home. They ground me, but my wife is really the big grounding force because I'll come, <laughs> I'll, I'll come home from a, from a gig and I'll go, oh, man, they just, I tore it up. It was like, oh, it was so amazing. It was great. And you should have seen they were up on their feet. We were partying. You know, we had the whole place rocking, thousands of people. And she said, that's so great, honey. Now, could you take the garbage out? <laughs> <laughs> I love Christiana for that. She's great. She is absolutely un, she's unflappable. She is a, a rock. But they're all very supportive. Very supportive. My daughter is probably, and you all know my daughter. Yeah. I mean, anybody who knows me, you've seen my daughter at my shows. and she, Biggest fan. She's a huge fan. She's the first one up dancing and the loudest one in the audience. And yeah. I, I love her for that. I just <clears throat> love, love, love her for that. Now, uh, I want to talk to you real quick about a, a bit of a sensitive subject because sadly we just lost Jeff Golub. Yes, we did. He, uh, you, you guys were really close. Yes, we were very close. You met when? Uh, you know, Jeff, um, Jeff and I met in 1989, mm -hmm. and uh, I joined the Rod Stewart Band, and that's where I met Jeff, and he was, he was playing guitar, and he was just up there being Jeff, and, um, <clears throat> you know, we instantly became very, very close friends, mm -hmm. your best friends, and, um, you know, we, we kind of, you know, the experiences we had traveling the world, we, we had each other's backs, we had... I mean, Jeff was just, uh, you know, he's, he, he's a friend that I'll never replace. Um, he used to stay at my house. I produced, I brought him into the smooth jazz world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Jeff played with Billy Squire. He, he, he was Rod's lead guitar player. And he'd get up there, and I saw him play in front of 60,000 people in Wembley Stadium and just get up there and, 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 and absolutely um, bring the audience to its feet. Yeah. You know, so, and, and we... You know, so when I when I got my record deal, um, somebody was crazy enough to to allow me to bring in an, an artist. And the mm -hmm. first person I thought of was Jeff Golub, and I took the record company president and vice president to uh, to one of the Rod Stewart gigs at the at the Forum in L.A. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, you know, I'm on stage, but after I said I'd really like to bring Jeff in, and they said, great. And then they said, well, we'd like to come up with a band name. And then of course, Avenue Blue, the first couple of records were Avenue Blue. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, you know, it just it just kind of took off. And Jeff had to change his whole sound. I mean, it, he's he was he was up there playing with Rod, and he had a stack of Marshalls behind him in the leather, and you know, with the hair, and just hitting those you know the power chords. And he he came up with an identity. We came up with an identity that that uh, you know one of the one of the early hits uh, was Stockholm, and and then and then also uh, pick up the pieces. Of uh -huh. course, was one of his his early hits. <clears throat> Uh, he used to come and stay at my house. Uh, There's a we, our, the guest room, so he would he would stay there every time we made a record. And Jeff is responsible for more or less my wife and I being together. Really? You know, um, it was really really funny because uh, she flew from Germany. I met Christiana in Germany, and uh, on the Rod Stewart tour. And then she flew to Los Angeles to when, visit. When was this? This was like nineteen, uh, like ninety one. Okay. Like ninety one. And so it wasn't, honey, when was that? 95. 95. See? Now that's you're in I, trouble. That's why I need her. No, if I make it earlier, it's good. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> so 95, she flew from, uh, from Germany to Los Angeles to visit. But I had to fly to New York to produce Jeff's record. So... We f so I called her from New York and said, well, I'm in New York. Would you fly to New York? And then she flew from, she said, of course. So she flew from L.A. to New York to visit with me. And uh, Jeff actually gave us his apartment to stay. He found somewhere else to stay. So the first time my wife and I were, you know, really together was in Jeff Golub's apartment. <laughs> We are not gonna go, go ahead. Go. I know what. Go ahead. Go We're ahead. actually going to go to go, break. We'll be right ahead. back <laughs> with, break yeah, with uh, Rick Braun. <laughs> Welcome back to Backstage Pass. Here with Rick Braun. Rick, I want to ask. Um, no, no, no. Don't I, ask I'm what not, you want to ask. No, no, no. I'm not going back to that. But uh, in, in, on a serious note, though, when, you know, you, you've been great friends with Jeff for a long time. You've stayed at his apartment. He stays at yours. Mm. When he starts to lose his eyesight and he calls yeah. you and you first hear that, yeah. you don't know it's PSP. You don't know. It's no. just the optic nerve collapsed and yeah. you don't know anything else. Yeah. Uh, how did that affect you and how did, the re how did his relationship with you? I, when, when Jeff first lost sight in, his, in one eye, um, he was, you know, he, a couple days um, Later, he was at our house and spent his birthday, mm -hmm. April 15th, with us and with the family, his family, and we were together. And I had lost vision in one of my eyes suddenly and temporarily. I had, I had a, 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 a blood vessel burst, and I, was, I, went, I walked into Trader Joe's. I could see with two eyes. I walked out, and I was blind in one eye. And is this was, prior to Jeff? It is prior to Jeff. Okay. So I had personal experience with okay. what he was going through. I didn't know where it was going to lead, but I, I you know, so he said, how did you get around? I said, well, your depth perception is strange. And I asked him, are you seeing anything out of the eye at all? Or, and he was saying, he was seeing light flashes and things like that. Because people think when you go blind, you see nothing. Right. But, but some, but you see some, you know, some people see flashes of light and things like that. Right. So it's just, it's like noise. It's like visual noise. Yep. And that's, that's what he was having at that point. You know, see, he was at our house. And uh, staying with us when, when that happened. And so I was just saying, you know, man, it's, you know, hang in there. It's, you know, you can get through this. Yep. And then I saw him again because when he had just lost vision in both of his eyes, he played one of the most amazing shows he'd ever played. And he was newly blind. And it was at a place at Jazz Fest West. Mm -hmm. And he played a blues. It was when he was doing his blues project. And he had this amazing band. And there was this... Uh, white drummer from New York who you would swear was a black man from New Orleans the way that he sang and I forget his name but he was so talented and Jeff got up there and he was so blind but he sat there and just played and played and played and we thought he's gonna be fine and then later that day Stevie Wonder sat in with us and wow. I was doing uh, Jazz Attack and with me I think and Gerald and um, and we played our show Stevie Wonder got up and sat in with us <laughs> And then Stevie Wonder and Jeff got together and talked. And that was, that was something. Wow. That was really something. And Stevie had some really good encouragement to, for, for Jeff, you know. And again, we didn't know. And Jeff was determined as, determined as hell, man. You know, he's like, I've got to go to the bathroom. Can we walk with you? No, I can do it. And then he found his right. way up. And we watched him do it. And, and all of us 
who were close to him were sitting there and go, he's going to be fine. Where, where, where were you, excuse me, when uh, you heard he passed? <clears throat> oh, God. Um, we were, I, I, was, I was in the airport coming back from our, my New Year's Eve show in Tucson, and, uh, and, uh, board, and I was just getting ready to board a plane. And uh, Kirk texted me. Kirk uh, texted me that he had passed, and we got on a plane. And um, that was a tough flight. Was Christiana with you? Yes, she was. And I showed her the text. We were sitting at the gate, and I just I showed her the, the, the text, and I wa had to walk away. Were your kids with you? Uh, yeah, the kids, kids were with us, yeah. <clears throat> so it was tough. It was, it was tough. a tough moment. You know, but it was time for him to go. He was stubborn. He was a yeah. stubborn man, man. He was determined not to go. Um, Chris's birthday was uh, December 22nd, and he was determined not to go then. And he was determined not to have it interfere with Christmas. And he said, I don't want it to linger long on into January. You know? And prior to January 1st when he passed, when was the last time you spoke to him? I went to visit him a couple times. And then um, it was a few weeks back, but you couldn't really speak to him at that point. Right. Audrey would take the phone and hold it up to his ear. And then she'd tell you that he was, sm he was smi smiling a little bit. You know. Well, he's in a much better place now. That's yes, sure. he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. I want to uh, talk about one I more thing. When, when, before the we, New Year's ahead. Eve? No, I, I want to talk about, we, we, we are doing a project for Jeff, and it's, uh, we've yeah. taken his old guitar tracks, to tracks that we, we went back and found tracks that weren't used, and we've created new songs and redone old songs around them. So that project's coming out soon. Who, who's out. all involved? Uh, myself, Steve Miller, who's a dear friend and engineer uh, for many years, um, and Bud Harner's had a big part in it. From his on, management on the On the mm -hmm. artist side, we've got Dave Cause playing on it, Boney James, uh, Brian Culbertson, um, I'm on it, um, Mindy Abear's on it. Mm -hmm. Um, all of the guys came awesome. around. The, the hard thing was there's so many people playing on this record. The tough thing was getting finding space for everybody who wanted to be a part of it. Right. But it's it's a good project. When should we expect it at? We're hoping in a couple of months. And of course, all the proceeds from that are going to go to the family. Yeah. Well, we'll definitely keep you informed with our uh, yeah our email blast and our, and our website too. Uh, but I do want to talk, because we, we don't have a lot of time, but I do want to talk. You do New Year's Eve. Is it every year you're in Tucson? Every year. Yeah, every year we're in Tucson. And, I mean, you must see the same faces. They must see, it's like family, right? It's kind of like the cruise. It kind of, yeah, it is. It's very much like the cruise. And uh, it's, a, it's a benefit for autism. And so it's, it's a really fun party for a great cause. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, this, this, was, uh, this was a great year. We had Larry Braggs and Peter White and Richard Elliott. So, of course, we did a little Tower of Power tribute. Yeah. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, it's been growing every year. And, um, and it's fun. We have a silent auction, and er Ernie Els has donated some things uh, uh -huh. in the past, and we have some great packages that we give away. Do you have a lineup for next year? I don't. I don't yet. But, you know, come on to my uh, Facebook page and uh, give me some suggestions. We're going we're gonna to And it's all advertised, too, on your website. It is. Website, Facebook page. RickBraun.com. RickBraun.com or my official fan page on Facebook. I try to keep in touch with people. Man, thanks so much. I'm, I, uh, I know... When you lose such a dear friend, and, and I know that Jeff is a really, really good friend of yours, and I know it's difficult to talk about, but I, I really appreciate that you opened up yourself to, to everybody, because um, we really haven't had a chance, I haven't had a chance really to talk to many people about it, and, and you, I couldn't think of anyone closer that, that was to Jeff, so I really, really appreciate that, and uh, good luck with your, your new album and, and the project for Jeff, and uh, hopefully I'll come down to Tucson, and hopefully everyone else will. Yeah, everybody's invited. Thanks, man. <laughs> Great show. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. Rick Braun. Thank you very much. Yeah, brother.